Welcome to Preventing and Treating Inhibitors in Patients with Hemophilia, Strategies for Success, presented by the Postgraduate Institute for Medicine at OMED Live. My name is Dr. Patrick Fogarty, and I'm an assistant professor of medicine at the Perlman School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and I'm also the director of the Penn Comprehensive Hemophilia and Thrombosis Program. Activities on OMED Live are interactive, so thank you for joining us, and please make sure that you submit your questions in real time throughout this presentation. You may enter them at any time through the course of the presentation in the box located at the lower left-hand side of your screen. I'd now like to introduce our co-presenter and colleague, Dr. Lindsey Green, who is a fellow in pediatric hematology and oncology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Dr. Green, thank you for joining us today. I'll now hand the program over to you to begin our discussion. Okay, well, welcome everybody. It's my pleasure to be here. And I think without further ado, we'll, we'll get started with the program. Here are our disclosures. So as a brief introduction, the hemophilias are X-linked congenital coagulation disorders due to deficiencies of factor VIII in the case of hemophilia A and factor IX in the case of hemophilia B. As you can see in this depiction of the coagulation cascade, uh, deficiencies of factor VIII and factor IX result in abnormalities in the intrinsic coagulation cascade, ultimately resulting in a defect of the tenase complex and thrombin generation necessary for clot formation. Uh, hemophilia occurs with it at an estimated frequency of 1 in 10,000 births, uh, which approximated a world, uh, estimated world population of 400,000 hemophilia patients. And importantly, particularly for pediatricians, a third of these cases result from spontaneous uh, de novo mutation. So with, will occur in children that otherwise do not have a family history of hemophilia. Hemophilia A is five times more common than hemophilia B. <clears throat> and then in both uh, hemophilia A and in hemophilia B, the phenotype is, is well predicted by factor activity levels. So the severe phenotype results most typically from patients that have factor VIII or factor IX levels less than 1%. And these are the patients that have the bleeding characteristics that I think we all commonly think of in hemophilia, which are uh, uh, characterized by spontaneous bleeding events and the hallmark of, of common, most commonly thought of in hemophilia are joint bleeds or hemarthrosis. Um, of course, these patients can also have other bleeding events, mostly uh, otherwise uh, intramuscular bleeds, spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage, et cetera. Moderate hemophilia is characterized by factor levels between 1 and less than 5%. And these patients, while they can have spontaneous bleeding events, it's much less common than in severe hemophilia patients. And these patients most typically have bleeding as a response to mild uh, either trauma or, or uh, procedural intervention. And then patients with mild hemophilia are the patients that have factor levels between 5 and less than 40 percent. And, and these patients sometimes um, most commonly have bleeding in the, in the setting of major trauma. And, and uh, my colleague, Dr. Fogarty, who's an adult hematologist, might diagnose these patients later on in life presenting after surgery or something of that nature. Um, and so just to focus a bit more on the, the topic of discussion today, uh, looking specifically at and development of inhibitors in hemophilia A and B. So what is an inhibitor? An inhibitor is an allomune IgG antibody that neutralizes the infused clotting factor. So can, in the case of hemophilia A, would be a, an antibody to factor VIII, or in hemophilia B, would be an antibody to factor IX. Um, this in, in the United States and in developed countries is currently the most severe treatment-related complication. Um, but with the caveat, I think that just to appreciate uh, our more global picture, only about 20% uh, of the world's hemophilia population actually has reliable access to either clotting factor concentrates or recombinant products. So again, this is really an issue um, most commonly associated with uh, developed nations such as our own. Um, inhibitor development is far more common in uh, severe patients than in patients that have mild or moderate hemophilia, and this is more pronounced in hemophilia A than hemophilia B, but globally, uh, inhibitors are most commonly observed in patients with, with the severe hemophilias. Looking specifically at hemophilia A, uh, about a thir approximately a third of patients with hemophilia A will go on to develop inhibitors. And then uh, less commonly in patients with mild to moderate hemophilia, and actually there's been some great work recently that has uh, tried to further characterize the instance of inhibitor development in mild and moderate hemophilia, which is generally thought to be around 5 to 15 percent. 
Inhibitor frequency in hemophilia B is less common. It's observed in <clears throat> anywhere from 1% to 5% of patients that have severe hemophilia B. And actually, it's, it's so, uh, occurs so rarely in uh, mild to moderate hemophilia B that it's actually not, it's, it's difficult to approximate uh, an incidence. So the unit of measure that we use is the Bethesda assay. Um, and I actually want to show, go through, uh, so this is provided by Dr. Fogarty, um, to, just to run through how a Bethesda assay is done. And I think this will help, help people try to in, uh, better interpret the assay. So the way uh, a Bethesda assay is done is you take uh, plasma from uh, your patient and, and then you take plasma, plasma from a, a normal, pooled normal plasma. And what the Bethesda assay is, is uh, uh, serial dilution. So just if you take, um, so if you take it the first time point, so you have 50% of uh, patient's plasma, 50% of pooled normal plasma, and you do a PTT-based assay to look at factor eight levels, and you, you do serial dilutions until you have uh, factor eight activity that, it's, that is at least 50%. And at that level, you take the reciprocal of that, and that gives you the Bethesda titer. Now, that sounds a bit complicated. So the point being that, um, so for, for an example here, you see at the 1 to 5 dilution. So 20% of the plasma is that of the patient, and 80% of, of it is that of, of pooled normal plasma. You take the reciprocal of what that dilution is, and that gives you the Bethesda titer. So for example, a Bethesda titer of 1 would mean that you've neutralized 50% of circulating factor. Um, I think hopefully that will be helpful too when thinking further about the management of these patients. So we have the first polling question. Yeah, sure, and thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction to our educational session here today, Dr. Green. I think you've brought us through um, the spectrum of hemophilia, how it presents uh, degrees of severity of disease, and then of course the really most serious complication in the developed world, which is inhibitor development. Uh, for this question, um, and I'd like the audience to uh, consider this question along with me, um, we have a 30-month-old African-American boy with severe hemophilia A on prophylaxis, uh, which means, according to um, Medical and Scientific Advisory Council guidelines of the National Hemophilia Foundation, that he is receiving um, prophylactic infusions of uh, typically a recombinant uh, factor VIII, um, either every other day or three times a week. Um, and this young child develops a left knee bleed. Um, and kind of concerningly, he has received his dose of prophylaxis just that morning, uh, which one would have thought uh, to be protective against uh, a joint bleed. So um, let's consider what the next step in management should be. Um, should the staff at the Hemophilia Treatment Center or other healthcare providers who are hearing about this situation direct the boy's mother to deliver a 50% uh, correction factor dose? And that would mean giving enough uh, factor VIII concentrate or factor VIII product to raise the factor VIII level in the boy's blood to 50%. Should the mother be directed to deliver 100% a correction? Choice C is to refer the patient to the emergency room for evaluation of the knee as well as administration of recombinant factor VIII. Um, or D, should he be referred to the emergency department for evaluation for a possible inhibitor? And I'll let the audience uh, consider these choices. Um, and I, while we're waiting for responses, yeah. I might say this is not really all that atypical of a situation, is it? Because as you mentioned, inhibitors complicate up to 30%. Uh, maybe even a little bit more, of management of severe hemophilia A. And um, I think individuals who are managing these uh, typically young children need to be ready for calls like this from, uh, from um, you know, family members yeah. uh, when an unexpected bleeding event happens. Would you uh, concur? No, I agree completely. I think, you know, thankfully in this, in this country, much of hemophilia management occurs outpatient and over the telephone and is, is wonderful for our families. Um, but it also kind of keeps you on your toes to make sure you're giving the appropriate advice when they call in. So. Right, exactly. So um, we have some responses from our participants today, and it appears that uh, the majority of participants selected choice C, uh, refer the patient to the emergency department for evaluation of the knee and administration of recombinant factor VIII. Um, and while I would, uh, you know, commend those who